Hello everyone, and welcome back to another Hearts of Iron 4 dev diary. This week it's Bag of Tricks 2, the sequel, talking about all the loose ends, the knickknacks, and all the bric-a-bac that doesn't actually make it into the major dev diaries. As some of you may have noticed, I didn't make a dev diary last week due to feeling a little under the weather, but don't worry, so we can cover some of that at the end of this dev diary for those who missed it. There's not too much to cover, just some stuff about trains. But since this video is about Bag of Tricks, Let's start with Bag of Tricks. So, this week's Dev Diary begins by talking about how we're going to cover some minor points, but for those who are wondering, there won't be a Dev Diary next week, which is just terrible timing for me returning. We should have rescheduled this better, but never mind. Regardless, if you're looking for Dev Diary content next week, you'll have to look elsewhere and wait for the week after. But hey, maybe it means there's something more exciting on the horizon. So, the opening topic is regarding Scorched Earth, which is a new mechanic coming with No Step Back and the new update, which allows you to destroy the railway infrastructure inside your country if you think you're about to be invaded, and all your rails are going to be taken over. As we can see in this image here, for the low low price of 5 command power, you can click this wonderfully luminescent pink button called Scorched Earth and destroy your railways, which means they will be in your construction queue needed to be repaired and stopping people from being able to convert to them and use them for their own devices. So immediately we can see here this is going to be important perhaps for Soviet players particularly who are having to push back from the front and ensure that the Germans advance is much more hindered, especially with deploying their troops on different parts of the Soviet line. So Scorched Earth I can definitely see being played there. Also perhaps on the French front, um, certainly as you're being Blitzkrieg you may want to try and slow that down with Scorched Earth, I could definitely imagine. Why it's being shown here in Silesia is another question entirely. Um, unless the Germans are really planning to lose Danzig or war, I'm not sure they need to worry too much. But it is interesting to see that the foreign claims do have Silesia as an independent releasable if they choose to be. It is at this point I feel obliged to wonder whether we are going to get a releasable German Kingdoms preset in the game options. Uh, for those who want to play with it, it's something I've been wondering for a long time, so with the introduction of Silesia, I don't think it's that obscene, but who knows. But anyway, sticking on the topic of Scorched Earth, we can also see in the construction queue that once you have destroyed your own railways and such, you won't want to repair them yourself, as that kind of defeats the purpose of you blowing them up in the first place. So once you've destroyed them, you won't be able to repair them, as seen in this construction queue, until you reactivate the ability to repair them inside the state itself. What this image also shows is how there are multiple different levels of uh, railway in Ostmark. Um, we can see four here, definitely. But it also makes me wonder whether there's a far more cunning strat involving building as many railways as you can just to destroy them all to fill up your opponent's construction queue with tons of uh, railway that they need to repair, simply just to annoy them, so they have to scroll through uh, an entire page of railway just to do anything. But in all seriousness, it does make me think about how, because railways are built by province, having the ability to immediately destroy all of your railways in a state for five command power is quite a powerful ability, especially when certain states are far bigger than others, so I guess you obviously don't want to waste your civilian factories building a ridiculous amount of railways where they're not needed, but I could certainly imagine that overstacking railways in one state could leave some serious damage that could never be repaired, so maybe building sparingly between states is uh, something to consider. Um, there may be some strategy about where railways are built that we'll have to see develop in time. As a final note on Scorched Earth, they mentioned that you won't be able to destroy factories with the Scorched Earth, unfortunately. So uh, there, there will be no burning down of the mills before you make your quick escape. So the next topic is preferred tactics. So as some of you may remember, there was a dev diary previously, I think it was Officer Corps 2, which talked about how they're introducing a national preferred tactic, which would genuinely make a minor probability buff to ensure that your nation had a higher chance of your divisions doing a certain tactic. With the changes with this bag of tricks, 
you now can have an additional level with a leader trait. In the case here of Mr. Sep, Sep? I think he's called Sep. In the case of Sep, once you reach a level 5 general, you have the option to choose a preferred tactic. This means that the preferred tactic of the general will be in addition to your national preferred tactic, just stacking up the buffs of certain uh, tactics being favoured when two different divisions come to blows. The long and short of it is, is that now there's going to be three different levels of tactic preference that you're going to have to take into account. There's going to be your national preference, which is what generally all of your uh, army is going to be focused towards. There's going to be what your field marshal is going to want, which is the person who controls the individual generals. Typically it's five generals per field marshal. And then there's what the individual generals prefer tactic is as well, assuming that they're all level five. So in the case of Germany, where you've got perhaps a lot of uh, tanks and motorized, you may want to focus far more on breakthrough with your Blitzkrieg. So making sure that your national and uh, generals have a focus on Blitzkrieg and breakthrough is something you may want to focus. Um, you can stack all three tactics in this case to let's say be breakthrough, but there is diminishing returns on having the same thing as well as being very counterable because everything is just the same. So it's going to be breakthrough, breakthrough, breakthrough more often, which means the enemy's ability to do different reactive things may counter you. Also, once you've picked a preferred tactic for your generals or field marshals, you can't change them. So if you have built up your generals to be specifically focused on, in this case, breakthrough, you can't change that. That's just out of the question for you. This may be a problem if, let's say, you're Germany and you're suddenly having to mount a defense on the Western Front, and you've specially made all of your generals for an offensive push, but now you've got America knocking in on the Western, perhaps on the soft underbelly of Europe. Then you're going to start needing some defensive doctrines, but you don't have any generals who have that tactic preference, so you're going to be slightly weaker. Also, in addition, as a brief reminder, there was the introduction of Army, Navy and Air Spirit, which do have the added tactic chance, as well as the chance of different generals getting new traits. Um, and since some spirits require you to have certain traits, specifically Trickster, um, Engineer, I think, Panzer Leader, making sure that your spirits are focused towards getting these tactics may be an additional thing to consider to really maximize your offensive. Okay, following on to the next thing, we have strategic redeployment, which is pretty much as sensible and straightforward as it sounds. Now, when you strategically deploy divisions, they're going to have a uh, separate calculation to realize where there's a railway and figure out which best path to take to get to the tile you sent them to. So in the case of the image we can see here, the divisions are going to move west, northwest along the railway and then take a small truck ride to the northeast to the tile they need to go instead of crossing a random river and traveling through some god awful territory. We also have a second image where it's kind of difficult to tell which is the best path, but I think it does make sense. Um, sorry if I'm going to use my mouse for this one, but we've got, we move up northwest, we cross the river instead of going west, but we cross the river. So then we go south across a land tile back onto the Southern Railway line and follow it through to where we need to go. I think the point is that you don't have to cross. I, I generally don't know. Um, I've tried to look at it to figure out why the units are heading north and then going across a land connection south back onto a rail instead of just heading on the first immediate left rail. I don't really know why they're doing that, but perhaps you can tell me why you think they're doing that. I think maybe they're just lost. There's, there's no reasonable explanation. They just got lost. And so with that, we reach the end of this week's dev diary. Short as they seem to be these days, but nonetheless, some interesting changes. Um, specifically to do with uh, <laughs> being able to blow up your own railways. I look forward to seeing how that one's going to work. Let's take a brief stint over to the comments where we occasionally find some nuggets of gold and then quickly go over some trains from last week. So in this clarifying comment, we find out how strategic redeployment works in terms of different speeds. So the base speed of 
strategic redeployment is just five kilometers per hour. Um, if you choose to go by infrastructure, you have five levels of infrastructure and each infrastructure level adds one kilometer per hour. So five times one is one. <laughs> Added to the base speed of five, it's a maximum of 10 kilometers per hour for infrastructure. And in the same way, railways each add one uh, level in the five and they're five kilometers per level. So it's five times five is 25 added to the base speed of five kilometers per hour, that gets you 30 kilometers per hour for the railway. Long story short, it's three times faster to go by train than it is to go by car, assuming that you've maxed out your railways. Okay, and with that, that's this week's dev diary done. So I hope you enjoyed. Um, if you don't want to hear about last week's dev diary, I guess I'm done here, so I'll say thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time. For those of you who are staying, let's just quickly cover some railway guns. So last week we got to find out what was just below the armoured train, which we kind of already knew was coming, but there's the clarification, it's a railway gun, which has its own little slot to be researched. We also see that railway guns are specifically going to be built using military factories, you can do a maximum of 5 mils per railway gun, and you have no ability of deciding where they are deployed, it's just in a capital city, and in this case, we're talking about Tanatuva building railway guns. Good one, Tanatuva. So once you've built your railway gun using the maximum five mils that you can assign to it, it will just magically appear inside of your capital station. From there, you're going to have to decide where to drive the trains along the rails to their destination. This is the only part I'm a little bit confused about because since you're not really assigning it to anything, but we'll get to that in a sec, you may have to micromanage in certain cases exactly where your trains are. Unless you assign it to a division, it's going to be kind of difficult to really make sure your trains end up where they are, and you're going to be like uh, sending them on weird goose chases around random railway lines. As you can see here, you've had to right click on the division to get it all the way to the front line against Hungary. Luckily not everything is so deep and dark though because you do have the ability to assign the trains to a specific general's army so that in the case that there is a front line they can get as close as they can to it using the railway line and add some support from that distance. Um, they can never go off the track though so if your army goes far away from a rail you control, I don't know, I, I do guess the train just AFKs, what else is it supposed to do? It can't travel by dirt I don't think. That being said, it is not important for the railways to go directly next to the front line, um, so long as it's relatively near, I think it must be within like a two to three range um, tile area, because as we can see here in Romania, it's relatively large, but it kind of just depends on the size of the tile. Regardless, any divisions that are fighting within the radius of this circle will get the buffs of the artillery gun. The buffs of the artillery gun themselves are more so just a, let's say, a static modifier that is applied to divisions fighting in its AoE, which we can see here as a railway gun bombardment, which is a negative 15% to their defence, cancelling out the entrenchment and commander skill in this particular battle. Because of that, it's not really important to death stack your trains in one location, since it's just a modifier. It's not like you need to build up divisions to achieve a certain threshold, you just stick the railway guns down, make sure it's in a particular area, and you get the negative 15% for your enemy. Something to note is that when your divisions are attacking another division, if there is um, enemy gun bombardment, there is now a little three lines you can see just above the combat bubble that tells you that there is enemy gun bombardment, which uh, may be screwing somebody over. With that, we get to see a large collection of different types of uh, artillery gun trains that you could potentially use um, from various different nations that all look quite cool. Um, but overall, it seems that the artillery gun is going to be a maybe something you build very short term and then stop, because since it just gives you a static modifier in an AoE, you don't really need to build tons. You just need to build enough to cover as much of your front line as you assume you're going to need. So would you ever need more than like 20? I couldn't imagine you'd be in a front big enough that you couldn't disperse 20 railway guns along different points of a front line. Regardless, it's something for those nations that have the extra mills to spare um, and definitely have the railway lines that could use them. So 
definitely something to see on the Eastern Front, and I'll look forward to seeing my little guns shoot off onto enemy tiles. So with that, I'll say thank you very much for watching. Um, that's last week's Dev Diary. Sorry I wasn't able to cover it last week, but I uh, wasn't feeling my best. Better now though. If you enjoyed the video, I'll say thank you. And um, feel free to like and feel free to subscribe as it really helps me out. And um, I guess I'll see you next time. And remember, it's not the size of your artillery gun that matters, it's how you deploy it.